welcome to Market Domination. I'm Julie Hyman. That's Miles Udlin sitting next to me today. Josh Lipton is off for the day. Here we are at our New York City headquarters. We're giving you the ultimate investing playbook to help tune out the noise and make the right moves for your money. And here's your headline blitz, getting you up to speed one hour before the closing bell rings on Wall Street. And as a bull, I'd rather much see the Fed cutting less because the economy is very strong than the Fed having to cut uh, because the economy is weakening. And I don't think it's really about when the Fed starts cutting. I think it's really about how. We think this is going to drive uh, the future value of Tesla when we look out five years. We think it'll be two thirds of the enterprise value in, in five years. So, so we're super excited about it. Can't wait for August. Well, let's call this the cyber taxi. It's going to be a disappointment. There's no way this is going to be as funny as the dancing robot uh, when Tesla you know, announced they were, they were going to crush what Boston Dynamics has done. I am not a believer. <laughs> one of the most phenomenal events that you get to see. I've seen a number myself, but basically it just so happens that the moon is 400 times closer, but 400 times smaller. And so they happen to be the same size in the sky. We've got one hour to go until the market close. And let's take a look at the major averages here. Not much change. I should mention, we have seen a drop in volume as the eclipse is occurring, at least here on the East Coast, as we see it track its path of totality. Last time I checked, the Dow was running about 10% below the 100-day average of volume. So definitely folks are paying attention to other things, some of them today. But we have the Dow, not much change right now, up about 37 points. The S&P 500 up about the same, a tenth of 1%. The NASDAQ up a little bit more, but not seeing much change at this point. What we continue to keep an eye on here is what's going on in the bond market as well. Yields continuing to trend higher here, up four basis points today on the 10-year. And if you look at a one-year chart of the 10-year, you'll see we are back to where we were kind of in mid to late November. So this is something that we are hearing more discussion about more attention being paid even as we see traders really pricing in fewer odds of fewer rate cuts this year so it's interesting those things going on at the same time sector action today we are seeing again not huge moves with the exception of consumer discretionary up about 1.1 percent today and then we got healthcare falling a little bit today real estate and utilities also doing well in today's session and miles what do you keep an eye on today i mean there's only one thing I hope everyone's watching it right now, and I hope they're wearing the correct uh, protective lenses. I mean, we don't need, we're having this debate like all day. How dangerous is it to really look at it? I'm not gonna offer any opinions on the air. I'm not a medical expert. But here <laughs> we have, uh, courtesy of our friends at NASA, we have a feed of, I guess, this is the sun. It is dangerous. Uh, is it the sun or the moon? What are we looking at? We're looking at the moon in front of the sun. Moon in front of the sun. Right, but when exactly. you say I'm looking at the eclipse, would you say I'm looking at the sun? I'm looking at the moon. I don't, a semantic? I, well, I, I just know. said sun, but I realized, to your point, as you just both. told us, we're really looking at the moon. In front of the sun, correct. Is, you know, and by the way, it is way dangerous. Closer. What it's dangerous to look at is the sun at any time. At any time. But it is correct. very tempting to look at the sun when the moon is in front of it, hence the correct. increased danger okay. on a day like this. All right. Well, I, I guess we're going to keep looking at it. We'll talk about other stuff. We'll come back to this. We I don't will. know. How long does this even take? 40 minutes? Um, the whole, the the whole, whole thing? thing of it? Something it's like been that. going on for, okay, my whole life we've been looking at the sun. Okay, <laughs> stocks flat to start the week. Investors caught between last week's jobs report and CPI and earnings starting this week. Tim Murray is capital market strategist in the multi-asset division at T. Rowe Price, and he joins us now. Tim, let's start by looking ahead to this week's inflation data. Jamie Dimon, uh, warning today on the risks, inflation is stickier than expected. That could keep rates elevated. Now, last year, markets got pretty comfortable with the idea that inflation had a one-way ticket back to 2%. How have you looked at this year's data, those January and February readings? Um, do they upset that idea as far as you see it? Yeah, I think they really do. I would agree with uh, what Jamie Dimon said. It looks sticky from here. Um, I think the important thing when you look at inflation prints is to understand the underlying components of inflation. So essentially, if you think about it, you've got services inflation and then you've got goods inflation. When we were at 9%, you know, back in June of 2022, the contribution to that was 6% from goods inflation and 3% from services inflation. Now we are at 3% inflation 
And all of that is services inflation. We had goods go from a 6% contrib contribution to nothing. And I mean, what that tells you is that it's all about services from here. And I can tell you that all that improvement from goods, that was supply chains normalizing. The improvement from here that's gonna come from services, that's gonna have to come from services, that's gonna be way harder. Uh, simply because services inflation is just very sticky. It's very dependent on uh, wage growth getting lower. It's dependent on housing prices getting lower. So, Tim, the, then the question becomes, if inflation is going to remain stickier, when is the Fed actually going to start cutting rates? And how do equity markets in particular behave in the meantime and as we get closer and then cuts start happening? Yeah, it's a really good question. The Fed, you know, the Fed would like to be cutting. You know, they've told us as much. They would like to be cutting, but they just need some evidence that um, that inflation is going to be continuing to come down. Hey, maybe we do get some some uh, surprises there over the next couple of months. Um, we had negative surprises in in January and February. We could have positive surprises uh, over the next couple of months. But absent those positive surprises. I mean, I think there's a really good chance that the Fed is stuck on hold and maybe even to the end of the year. Uh, and, and so what does that mean for stock prices? I think that's actually not a bad setup for stocks. I think it's, it's really important to recognize that stocks will do well as long as the economy is doing well and the Fed isn't hiking. I think that's really the big key is the Fed can be on pause as long as they've got in their back pocket those cuts, as long as they're telling the stock market, hey, if we start to see economic weakness, we'll act, we'll cut rates. Uh, but in the meantime, if you've got inflation being sticky and you've got the economic growth improving, the jobs market really looking strong, hey, that that's good for the stock market. That's not a, a warning sign. Uh, Tim, on that point, though, are you surprised at the the ease with which the market seems to have adjusted to that idea? Because if we go back in time six months, the notion that we would see you know, what is it, a half dozen meetings come and go with no change probably would have been fairly unpalatable to investors. But, you know, here we are sitting at record highs, um, you know, in April of 2024. Have you been surprised to see the flexibility maybe of the equity market over that time? Yeah, you know, I, I have not been all that surprised. Um, what I would say is, it, is the, the way it plays out in the market is that that has been a real headwind for small caps. If you go back and you look at kind of what happened at the end of last year, small caps had a really strong rally and some of the other cyclical areas had a really strong rally. They're dependent on the Fed. The, the large cap part of the market, the growthy part of the market, the MAG7 that's done so well over the last you know five quarters, they don't really need rates to be lower. They have plenty of cash. Um, uh, they don't need to borrow money. Small caps do. So I think that the, the way it plays out is that this, this trend we're on is bad for small caps, but it's okay for most of the market. Well, Tim, and it's really interesting what you just said. I want to just zero in on it a little bit, which you said the higher interest rates or at least persistently high interest rates are not necessarily bad for the likes of the MAG7 or tech. But again, sort of to Miles' point, that's pretty radically different than what we were seeing in the market you know, six months ago or a year ago, right, where they were perceived as a threat. Um, and so kind of what changed? Was it just sort of market participants' comfort level with this idea that you were talking about, let, if the economy is still growing and the Fed isn't hiking, that things are going to be okay? Yeah, so my answer to that is seems to be the answer to everything right now. Uh, what changed is AI. Um, so essentially what happened was you, you've you got these companies, the Mag, the Mag 7, that don't need to uh, borrow money uh, to, to, to invest. But they have cash. When you're a growth company, your cash flows are, are further out into the future. And if you think back to you know, your, your finance 101 class and the discount rate, the higher the discount rate, so the higher rates are, the more that makes cash flows in the future worth less. So that pushes down the value of cash flows in the future. And these growth companies, everybody is, continues to be excited about them because they've got really high growth rates, so they have real strong cash flows in the future. Well, AI brought all of those cash flow, or not all of those cash flows, brought a lot of cash flows forward. So now suddenly these, these companies where the thought was, hey, these are long duration cash flows that these companies receive, now they're not so long duration. And so when the rates go up, it's less of an impact 
to those companies. So, and, and that's why you've seen the AI companies really be the ones that have done well, and they're also the ones that that are getting impacted by higher rates. So then, Tim, you know, obviously, right in this um, area, we're talking about concentration risk generally with the market. You've seen the mega caps dominate. How have you talked uh, folks through that question, which you know inevitably you've gotten over the last several months here? Yeah, it's a it's a good question. You always, whenever you see the stock market do this well, when you see valuations, right? Like we we have the S and P five hundred PE above twenty, you always have to be concerned about you know is a bubble forming? Is uh, is there a reason to be to get really defensive? Um, has has the rally been justified? What I would say is one of the ways we look at it, we think is really important, is to to look at the momentum factor. So I'm going to get it go a little bit into kind of the quant world here for a second. Bear with me. So you look at the momentum factor. If it's going up at the same time that quality factors are going up. So I, when I look at that, I'm talking about ROE. I'm talking about free cash flow, free cash flow margins. Those type of factors, when the momentum factor goes up along with quality factors, that's OK. That's not something to be scared of. Like to, to put it into you know plain English, what that's telling us is that Really good companies with really good outlooks are delivering really good results, and prices are going up. The stock market's rewarding those companies as it should. That's the way it's supposed to work. When you need to worry is when you get a momentum rally without quality working, because that's when it looks like a speculative rally. That's when you need to worry about, OK, hey, maybe we have we have a speculative bubble that's about to burst. That's what happened in 2000. It's what happened in 2021, and, and we saw the results. And so what you're saying, uh, it feels like you're expressing optimism on that point this time, that that isn't just happening now, but could continue. Does that mean you think that the upcoming earnings season will be perhaps a further catalyst for stocks? Yeah, I, I think that is absolutely true. I think certainly right now when valuations are, are as high as they are, it's hard for stocks to go up really you know, a lot because you don't have an earnings report telling you Hey, look how good the outlook is. Look how good the results are. So yeah, I think in this type of environment, as long as we're having the economy accelerate, AI get pulled forward, big companies having to spend on AI to defend uh, important monopolies that they have, that's going to mean when earnings season comes around, we get reminded of just how powerful these trends are. When you don't have earnings season, it tends to be you know a situation where investors start looking at those valuations and saying, "Boy, those are a little high." Uh, is this really, is it, has it gotten too far? Well, earnings season's coming around again next week, so we will keep an eye out. Tim, thank you so much. Really appreciate it. Yeah, my pleasure. Thanks for having me. We're just getting started here on market domination. Coming up, shares of MicroStrategy is surging today alongside Bitcoin on the back of a price target raise from Benchmark. We'll speak to the analysts behind the call on the other side. Plus, Tesla riding higher after Elon Musk said the company will unveil its robo-taxi on August 8th. We'll break down the latest and what this means for the EV maker later in the hour. And we'll continue to check in on the path of totality as New York City prepares for the peak of the solar eclipse. Stick around much more when market domination returns.
Benchmark is raising its price target on MicroStrategy today from $990 to $1,875. The analyst <laughs> noting the Bitcoin rally as the halving draws near. For more, we've got the author of that note. That is Mark Palmer, Benchmark Managing Director and Senior Research Analyst of FinTech and Digital Assets. Good to see you, Mark, as always. And as you know, there is a big debate going on when it comes to MicroStrategy and the premium at which it trades to Bitcoin itself. If you do various calculations, you can arrive at that premium. It's a big premium. Um, and so talk to me about why you think that premium is justified. Yes, uh, well, first of all, thanks very much for having me today. Uh, this is the big question that you see raised out there right now. Why is it that MicroStrategy is trading at such a big premium when somebody could just go uh, and buy Bitcoin themselves or buy a spot Bitcoin ETF. And to put this into perspective, the premium uh, to MicroStrategy's NAV um, you know, is, has been fluctuating, but it's been uh, more than one and a half times NAV, uh, which, which has brought us back to this question. I think that those who are raising this concern uh, are looking at things uh, from a static standpoint. Uh, that is to say, they're looking at where MicroStrategy's Bitcoin holdings are currently, uh, whereas as an equity analyst, I'm looking into the future and, and trying to gauge uh, a few things. One, uh, how much uh, Bitcoin will the company have a couple of years out? Uh, what will the price of Bitcoin be a couple of years out? And, and then how is the company going to be able to uh, get to uh, that higher level of Bitcoin holdings? Well, that's one of the uh, key differences between MicroStrategy and, and a spot Bitcoin ETF. Its ability to go out into the capital markets uh, to raise the proceeds to buy additional Bitcoin. And uh, the company has really timed the market uh, incredibly well. Uh, it's uh, two convertible debt offerings in March. Both had coupons less than 1%. You know, so they're borrowing at under 1%, turning around, and, and buying uh, an asset that has been uh, performing extremely well. And, and this is a big part of the reason. If you, if you stack up MicroStrategy shares uh, next to the Bitcoin itself, uh, it has significantly outperformed uh, Bitcoin uh, since the company initiated its uh, uh, Bitcoin acquisition strategy back in August of 2020. For that matter, it's outperformed the S&P 500, the NASDAQ, gold, silver, all the big tech stocks. So. Uh, the, the strategy has been proved out, and especially in a bull market, we think that a premium is, is justified. So then, Mark, you know, you guys are talking about 150000 per coin on Bitcoin, about double where we stand today. We'd love to have you uh, talk through a little bit of the thinking around what is the catalyst to get us, um, you know, an, a double in the price of Bitcoin uh, over the, you know, through the end of next year. Yes, you know, we're assuming that the price of Bitcoin will reach 150000 dollars by the end of 2025 due to two main factors. Uh, one is the supply shock that is caused by the Bitcoin halving. Uh, the fact that the new supply of Bitcoin is going to be uh, literally cut in half um, on or about April 20th uh, means that um, the, the supply is uh, simply going to fall off a cliff uh, at the same time that we are seeing a demand shock. Uh, which is the result of the SEC's approval of spot Bitcoin ETFs back in January. You know, we've already seen more than $34 billion flow into uh, the 10 spot Bitcoin ETFs, uh, not counting the grayscale uh, GBTC structure. Um, and that's really been a retail phenomenon. We haven't seen uh, the institutional investors get significantly involved yet. Uh, they're, they're sharpening their pencils, doing their homework. And when they get involved, we could really see the demand side of things uh, pick up materially, uh, which, which is why we feel that uh, the price of Bitcoin is going to um, outperform its 10-year uh, Kager uh, over the next uh, two years. Its 10-year Kager has been over 56 percent. Um, Mark, I'm sure you're aware of the recent um, sort of short report on MicroStrategy as its premium relates to the underlying action in Bitcoin. And one of the things that they talked about is that historically, even when or even after, I should say, MicroStrategy borrowed to buy more Bitcoin, as the price of Bitcoin continued to rally, that the premium to Bitcoin for MicroStrategy itself fell. 
So what, you know, even if Bitcoin gets to 150, what makes you confident that that premium will remain um, even as Bitcoin continues to rally? Well, that's one of the, the parts of the microstrategy structure that uh, I think is, is particularly attractive is the fact that uh, it does have embedded uh, optionality that, um, you know, if we were to see a reversal of the premium and, and if we were to see um, the stock trade uh, at a discount to NAV at some point in the future, um, well, frankly, then the company has uh, the ability to go into the market uh, to buy back its shares uh, and to uh, once again increase uh, the amount of Bitcoin it has per share, which we believe is a really key metric here. Uh, with that said, we believe that history, uh, if history is any guide, then uh, the period after the halving uh, when the price of Bitcoin uh, will be appreciated uh, is likely to be uh, in the neighborhood of a year and a half, a year and three quarters. That's what we had seen during the prior halvings in 2012, 2016 and 2020. Uh, so we expect that during this bull market, uh, that premium is likely to be sustained. And again, importantly, we do expect that uh, MicroStrategy will continue to tap the capital markets to buy more Bitcoin and that it will continue to use the free cash flow from its enterprise software business to, to buy even more. So I, I think that those are important points. Um, beyond that, uh, this is a, a firm that has uh, a, an enterprise software company that is uh, in many ways focused on um, business intelligence uh, as its core, uh, but it is focusing increasingly on Bitcoin and has expressed that it is looking to become a Bitcoin development company. If we're correct and Bitcoin uh, continues to surge during the next year and a half, we think that interest in this uh, area is going to be um, uh, much more front and center than it is currently. Uh, that is to say, actually building on the Bitcoin blockchain and MicroStrategy is uniquely positioned uh, to be able to expand in that area. All right, Mark Palmer, thanks for the time. Of course, good to talk to you. All right, shares of Take-Two Interactive up about 1.5% today. That follows an upgrade from analysts over at Citi. Jason Bazinet raising his price target on the stock to $200 per share, writing that risks around the timing of its upcoming Grand Theft Auto 6 game are manageable. The company last month also acquired Gearbox Entertainment, a deal that takes some of the pressure off its GTA, 2K, and Red Dead Redemption franchises. I was looking at the stock here, Julie, as we we're looking at this note and thinking about the state of the video game business overall. And I think when you look at the last five years of Take Two and you look at just where the comp where the industry sits in 2024, where uh, I don't need to tell you how much kids these days are interested in um, gaming, you, know, you do the, all the math, you know, time on the platform, how involved, you know, people are in all this. The, the thesis for, well, you know, buy it and it's going to go up has, I mean, has not worked to the extent that I think um, maybe like the cultural import of video games has perhaps not followed or has, you know, outpaced what the investment returns have been over, you know, kind of a long time period now. Well, you know, I'm a Fortnite slash Roblox slash chess online household right mm -hmm. now. So I don't, you know, we're not doing the Grand Theft Auto thing specifically, but yes, I do understand well the uh, the cultural hold that it has. And I mean, and that's kind of what the thesis of this note is, where he says like, even if it's late, yeah. it's still gonna be huge and we're not worried that it's gonna do well. Yeah, I, and I think I, you know, I, I look at it and one, you know, because I was a core GTA demo, uh, I did not realize was? that it had been, was. Well, that, so was is, is part of it. Okay. Two, I had not realized it had been 12 years since they, la or it's going to be 12 years. If this game comes out at the beginning of next year, it'll be 12 years since they last released uh, a version of GTA. And it also was like, that was a whole different era. That's, mm -hmm. you know, you go to GameStop. And you get there and you maybe you trade in something you had and you buy the thing. And that's like not like, yes, you I mean, obviously you buy the game over Xbox Game Pass or whatever it might be. But that whole model of like you need to get the upgraded game and then you need to get the add on pack and you need to buy all the discs. Yeah. And it, it's just it's a very different world where everyone wants to go to services, the Game Pass subscription. Right. And all this kind of, It's like it feels anachronistic, I guess. And if you look at the stock's gone nowhere in four years. So. Um, We're waiting for this. I, I think there's some questions whether this can change, I don't know, the fortunes, let's say. Of right. Well, we'll see. All right. We got to get to another call that we're watching. That's Huntington Bank Hard shares. Pivot. 
Rising after analysts from both Bank of America and Jefferies raised the stock to a buy. B of A analyst Ibrahim uh, Punawala citing accelerating revenue growth for the upgrade and basically saying um, that the company has been putting more money into franchise, new industry verticals, he says, market expansion, fee businesses. Also, that they are growing their auto uh, inventory financing, which I thought was interesting. And the other thing I thought was interesting is that, you know, we keep talking about what's going to happen as the Fed pushes back interest rate cuts. Yeah. And Punawala says this is a company that is going to benefit from that, um, that the company's uh, net interest income will be a positive catalyst, or will receive a positive catalyst from that. Well, and what's interesting about, you know, the regional bank trade is obviously you had a regional bank crisis about 13 months ago. So, you know, get rid of all of it. I don't want anything to do with it. Um, and, you know, Huntington Bank shares basically trading back to where the stock was, a little bit below where the stock was before you had the regional bank crisis. But the old, the old school meme on regional banks is, well, if the economy's doing well, you just buy them and you know, go to sleep, it's fine. Leverage better than the economy is what financials are, generally speaking, some people might say. Uh, and a regional bank, a smaller bank, is even more leveraged to that. But you know, it was interesting, as Tim Murray was telling us from T. Rowe earlier in the hour, all markets care about, all investors really care about, is you know the second derivative, the change in the rate of change. And so you see someone come out and upgrade regional banks. You know, to your point on, they can make do with the higher rates. Sure, it's more challenging for loans, but you can kind of get something with the money you have on hand. And so long as you are not ending ending up in a position where you're surprised by where rates go, if they go lower next, not higher next. Um, I, I mean, I'm, we're not really having that conversation, but maybe we will one day. Uh, these banks can all, everyone can kind of make do, right? right? You know, And whether it's a bank or any kind of corporate, you can figure it out if you know that rates won't at least go higher. And if you have, as, as Huntington does, 10% of your loan book is fixed, but then you're going to have repricing at some point and repricing at not a significantly lower rate mm -hmm. of your loans, then that's a good yep. thing. Yeah. Basically. And they have, you know, we didn't even get into the, the CRE exposure. We Which didn't. is on a relative basis lower than some of their peers. Yeah, there you go. Um, all right, let's take a look at the main event going on <laughs> as we talk about markets here on this Monday. That's the moon in front of the sun. <laughs> Where are we? What is that, Vermont? I can't see the little bug there. Somewhere, yes, Burlington, Burlington, Vermont. Burlington, Vermont. I know he's not watching, but Ethan Mann now is uh, is taking a One look. One of our editors here, editor of our morning brief I newsletter. Hope, I hope Ethan Mann is not staring at this without the aid of some sort of glasses, but you know. I guess I'll find out tomorrow and if he can do his job. This should also be peaking here in New York City as well, right around now. I can't quite. I have to no, look behind you. Have have to I can't quite close. see outside. All right, coming up, uh, Tesla trending today after CEO Elon Musk wrote uh, on X that Tesla will be unveiling a robo taxi service in August 8-8. That's a familiar date. We'll break down what this could mean for the EV maker on the other side of this break.
All right, well, the U.S. economy has impressed all year, but the flip side of this success are interest rates that may continue to stay higher for longer. Joining us now to discuss the economic outlook and more is Jonathan Pingle, chief U.S. economist at UBS. Jonathan, thanks so much for joining us. Let's take a look uh, back at last week. We had both the jobs report on Friday and we also had Chair Powell speaking, kind of outlining his view. We had a lot of Fed speak last week. I'm just curious, as we kind of move past that March meeting, we got the three rate cuts penciled in. Do you feel like the Fed is still there? Do they want to be there? How are you thinking about um, kind of all this build up towards June? It just kind of feels like where we'll be for the next eight weeks. Yeah, to be honest, that was one of the more remarkable things about Chair Powell's comments um, last Wednesday. Um, you know, the message he seemed completely unfazed, referring to a three month moving average of non farm payroll employment of 265,000. And even after the strong employment report on Friday, that average is now 276. So it's not a whole lot different. And on the Wednesday, in his comments, he referred directly back to the March summary of economic projections, you know, which, you know, the median participant had, you know, penciled in three rate cuts this year. So it's it sounds like to the chair, you know, setting aside a lot of the more hawkish rhetoric coming out of the regional Fed presidents, it does sound like to the chair that that March SEP is kind of still operable, to use a word that Chair Powell has used before. Uh, but I really do think it hinges heavily on uh, the inflation data we're going to get this week. I mean, I, you know, we can we can debate whether or not the strength in the employment report is enough to sort of keep rates higher for longer. Um, but I think ultimately. Um, you know, you had a guest on earlier saying the Fed sounds like they would like to cut. I, I, I think they would. Um, it's really inflation that's going to determine whether or not they can. Well, and it, it, it struck us today that you had Jamie Dimon in his shareholder letter saying, well, we're prepared for interest rates to be 2 percent to 8 percent or even more. I mean, that's a pretty broad range of what they're prepared for. And maybe he's just being Jamie Dimon and being safe and preparing for every eventuality. But um, the idea that we could see rates not come down, I mean, how how likely do you think that? I mean, some of your peers on the street, not many of them, but some of them are saying maybe we won't even get a cut this year. So, so first of all, the, the potential the, the, the potential for, you know, there's a, oh, <laughs> the risks of something happening are pretty, you know, and the potential range of potential outcomes here is pretty wide, right? So I, I think, you know, Jamie Dimon, and I, you know, think being, you know, in a bank, you know, certainly, um, you know, you, you you want to assess and be prepared for any of these risks. So, you know, it, it could be that inflation not only proves sticky, but starts to uh, resume increases. I think Chair Powell actually is worried about that risk as well. You know, when you get to July and August, the base effects are going to flip, right? We had very low month over month increases in inflation in July and August of last year. You replace those with relatively strong increases, and inflation's going. The year of year change is going to start to pick back up as you head into the end of this year. I think that's a scenario that um, the Fed wants to avoid, and I and I think that's the kind of scenario that would put you know rate hikes potentially back on the table at some point. I don't think that's the near term risk here. I think the risk right now is you know base effects are going their way. We are expecting a step down in the CPI uh, to be reported. Um, on Wednesday, you know, we'll get the full run of PPI CPI to look at the March PCE inflation data. I think that's really also going to tell us a lot about, you know, are we going to sort of stall at around two and a half percent inflation or, or, or is this likely to continue uh, moving lower? I mean, I think we're going to learn a lot, not just in, you know, the over the month change in March, but when we look at the components, um, it'll give us, I think, a much better sense of to go forward. And, and, you know, on that point about base effects, about the components going forward, I'm wondering, in your view, do you think the Fed has, I don't know, maybe levered themselves too much to housing in the sense that we have not really seen that index come down to the extent the Fed would like? It's been a very much, well, you know, rates, rates need to rent, rents need to, to feed through, six-month lag, all this kind of stuff. But we are still looking at, you know, 40 percent of the CPI is running almost 6 percent year over year. And at that point in the future, when maybe they get it towards 2 percent, to your point, you're now going to have a large part of the basket rolling off any of those easy comps. So is the Fed maybe going to be stuck at this 2.5 in a way it has not yet allowed itself to publicly admit? Well, I, 
I think you've kind of hit one of the nails on the head. I mean, that's a great question and it's a great point. And I think, you know, Chair Powell was asked in the last press conference about their general expectation that owner's equivalent rent and tenant's rent, you know, the biggest chunk of the CPI, you know, would those rent increases continue to slow, which is what's been implied by what we're seeing in the marketplace. When we look at, you know, new leases being signed, there are a range of different indicators, what we're hearing from the REITs, you know, rent growth in the market, you know, we can, there are some exceptions to that, but the rent growth broadly nationwide has slowed quite a bit and back to what looks like a pre-COVID pace or even below. It has not yet really fed into the CPI. Now, we are looking to see some evidence of that um, in the report on Wednesday. And if you do see a slowdown, you know, so, if, you know, it was, you know, roughly 45 basis points in the February report. You know, if you're starting to see something where it's in the low 40s in the March report on Wednesday, you know, that could be a sign that, you know, we are going to start to see further follow through from the slowdown and what's happening in the marketplace into what's being measured uh, in the CPI. As you said, there's a six month lag and that's because the departments are sampled every six months, but it can take even longer to get into the survey. There's another reason that's really important though. I mean, it is part of the Fed's expectation that inflation slows further, that they see that rent. So I think Chair Powell you know, one of the things he'd like to gain more confidence in when he thinks about when to begin dialing back restrictiveness is, you know, seeing some evidence that reinstills this confidence that those rent components are going to slow. Now, those rent components are also a big part of the gap between inflation in the CPI and inflation in the Fed's preferred measure, PCE prices. And one of the reasons I think the Fed is willing to look through that wedge at the moment is in part because if rents do slow, that wedge will narrow quite considerably over the course of the next year. And I think they would like to see you know, some confirmation you know, sort of for these two reasons. One, it's part of their expected slowing. Two, it makes their communications easier. You know, I really do think that they want to see a uh, you know, slower uh, gains in the month over month changes in, in the tenants rent and the owner's equivalent rent components of the CPI. Well, we're going to start to get some of that data on Wednesday, as you said, so we'll be watching it closely. Thanks, Jonathan. Appreciate it. Thank you. Time now for the day's trending tickers as we approach the closing bell on Wall Street. And we start with Tesla charging up in today's mm. trade. The move coming after CEO Elon Musk wrote in a post on X, announcing the company will be unveiling a robo-taxi on August 8th. Joining us here to discuss is Yahoo Finance's Prasad Ramanian. Prasad, very convenient that this announcement of an announcement came just after a report from Reuters that Tesla was abandoning its mass market car project. Yeah, you know, it's he's declaring this robo-taxi coming, but then also sort of not sort of announcing or not or not confirming whether the Model 2 is going to be canceled or not. He did say law, that the Reuters uh, report was, was not correct. Not, they're lying again, right, or something like that, but also not also saying that what's happened to Model 2. So anyway, right. got a mix of voices on Wall Street here, Deutsche Bank saying the good and the bad. The good is they're doubling down on a on a technology that cause is favorable, like favorable economics. Fewer, a few OEMs can actually imitate this sort of software solution here. Um, but then the bad is the Model 2 is not happening potentially. And that's like a driver of long-term growth for the, for the stock. I mean, better, higher margins, it's volume play, improved free cash flow. Those are things that are sort of concerned without the Model 2. You want Tasha Keeney's out there with ARC saying this is two-thirds of her $2,000 price target is the autonomy. Uh, then you have Craig Urban at Roth, right? Miles saying, it's, it's like an eclipse. It's obfuscating the announcement, obfuscating the problem to the company. It's a momentum trade right today, yeah. but obfuscating the fundamental problems of Tesla. Right I now. mean, I do wonder, I mean, the challenge, um, in a way, it's easier, I think, as a member of media to try to figure out Tesla, because it's like, oh, this person said that, this person said this, put them together, maybe it's this. As an analyst, when you're used to very heavily regulated communications from companies that you believe can be reliable, all these sorts of things, very different when it comes to Tesla. And I'm just curious, um, Will there ever be a point where folks who have made up their mind on the company one way or the other would ever be persuaded that things are actually the opposite direction, right? You have your perma bears on Tesla, you have your perma bulls on Tesla. It does not seem like there is much in the middle. Well, we've now you know, changed our model materially based on some development. 
Yeah, it's almost like the uh, jobs reality distortion field where people get sucked in and they want to believe whatever the good side is of whatever Musk pro proclamation we see. And this was yeah. basically a proclamation at the end of the bell, at the, after the bell on Friday yeah. that just turned the tide from a really bad day for the stock after a bad week. We were talking about this to look at us now, wait till August, we're going to see this robo taxi, no pedals, no wheels. But then on the flip side is, well, where is the Model 2? That's supposed to be a huge yeah. growth driver. So I, I, you, you can see both sides. Well, right. and the other reminder is, Unveiling a new product and actually making the product well, and bringing it to market are yeah. two very different things, especially when it comes to Tesla. Look at the gap between announcing the Cybertruck and coming out with the Cybertruck. Look at the promises of full self-driving and what it actually does. I mean, we've seen this movie before. Yeah, I mean, those regulatory hurdles aside, a lot of analysts are talking about, can we see something? And I think this is, at least in that step, we're going to see- it's something. <laughs> whether it's a Model 2 or a Robotax, we're going to see a new product. I think it's a big deal. Aside from everything else. Yeah. Mm. All right, pause, live there. All right, Air Community Stock, official name, Apartment Income Re Corp, surging on Monday as Blackstone Real Estate agrees to buy the apartment building's owner in an all cash transaction valued at around $10 billion. We have Blackstone here, Julie, making a big bet on luxury apartments. Air Communities operates about 76 communities. Um, the average income for folks who are buying one of these units, $237,000. So moving into that space, talk a lot on this show about um, you know, kind of what is the play within real estate? Right. Individual homeowners can't seem to buy a home. Commercial real estate, you don't want to touch that. So maybe you have your high-end multifamily is where Blackstone at least sees this opportunity. Right, and it's interesting because they, um, earlier this year, also bought a portfolio of single-family rental homes as well. So it's not as though they're just betting on luxury. Mm -hmm. They're also betting on the rental market, which is interesting given our discussion that we were just having with Jonathan Pingle about what's going to happen with rent inflation, right? When you have a Blackstone coming in and you're looking at this luxury, I mean, it's luxury, so it's not the yep. average rent, but it affects the average rent, right? It affects the overall calculation. So it's just interesting that Blackstone is making these kinds of moves. Yeah, and it's also a reminder, um, you know, this idea that we've circled, we talked about it with Huntington Bank shares earlier in the program, that, you know, why would you go in? Why would you make a big leverage bet on real estate at this point in the cycle? You know, rates are 4.5%, 10 years ticking up. Well, when you have some visibility as a black star, you think you have some visibility, and you can say, okay, well, we can finance it at this, we know we can refinance it lower, or we think we know we can refinance yeah. it lower in three years. You make your peace with it, you give it a shot, and to your point, this is not the average home buyer. Right, exactly. It's in urban areas, too, which I thought yes. was also interesting, given yes. the conventional wisdom about you urban You can split areas. your time. I could. Are <laughs> sports gambling stocks worth betting on? We'll discuss in our investor playbook. More market domination coming up.
This year's Women's NCAA National Championship game set the record as the most bet on female sports event of all time. That's according to several sports books. As the sports wagering industry continues to grow, which names are best positioned? We're looking at how to navigate the big picture with the Yahoo Finance Playbook. Joining us now, Jed Kelly, Oppenheimer Managing Director of, uh, of Equity Research, and Bernie McTiernan, and Needham and Company's Managing Director as well. Guys, thanks so much for being here. I, I want to talk big picture, first of all, because yes, we hear about these big events that spur a lot of activity. But overall, Jed, let's start with you. Talk to us about sports betting adoption in the U.S. and how well these companies are capitalizing on it. Yeah, I think, well, the numbers clearly speak to your, speak for themselves, right? You're seeing an industry that's probably going to grow well over 30% this year. So sports betting is being widely adopted. I think you just pointed out the women's tournament. That probably could bring another segment of the population in. Um, you know, it's it's particularly always been popular among, you know, males, call it 25 to 50. I think now you're seeing it, it's much easier to get on these apps when, you know, call it 10 years ago, you had to go through illegal channels and, you know, sports is popular. So the adoption, like we always thought was going to happen, I think now what you're seeing is you're now seeing these companies prove that they can become profitable and generate sustainable profitability. And that's what we've seen happen with uh, DraftKings, especially over the last 18 months. And Bernie, in thinking about um, the thesis you know, for these companies um, on adoption across the country, not every state uh, sports betting is legal yet, how much does that play in at this point? Are there states where you make your peace with it, maybe it will never happen, um, but you know, we focus on engagement in this, that, the other state? How do you think about that part of the story? Because obviously, go back in time, three, four years, that was kind of the whole thing. Yeah, no, it's, it's a really interesting point. And it's certainly something that we see the potential for greater. You know, right now, about half the country has access to online sports betting. It's much lower for iGaming, only 11% of the country. Um, over time, we think it's going to continue to happen. And I think it's what Jed was talking about earlier, too. When you start talking about the convergence of sports betting and sports media, it's becoming more mainstream, the cat's out of the bag. And this is something that consumers want to be able to do. Um, so we think that over time, it certainly can happen. Um, again, you know, whether it's referendum or whatever it may be, it may take a number of years. Um, but there's only about 10% of the country where, where daily fantasy was explicitly not allowed. And so that's what we view as the upper end of the potential here for, for online sports betting. And then iGaming reg legislation just has been slower, but as states um, you know, need more money over time, we think that's another avenue for them to explore to, to generate those funds. And Jed, um, why has there been such a, a differentiation in how some of these stocks have traded? Is it because if I look at something like a DraftKings, it's pure play, you know, online betting, whereas if I look at some of the legacy players, they still have their bricks and mortar operations? Yeah, that's exactly what it is. It's, you know, your brick and mortars, right? They're, you know, lease casino, like there's casinos with big leases where the, the inter where DraftKings and FanDuel are pure play internet companies that are using the internet to get scaled advantages. And what you've seen is, you've seen as most, as the states outside Nevada have legalized sports betting, DraftKings and FanDuel continue to consolidate market share. And, you know, they're they're essentially judged on different different parameters, right? I think you have MGM, Caesar shareholders where, where they're like, we don't need you to be 25% of the overall market, right? This is a ni nice add-on where DraftKings and FanDuel you know, they need to have over 30% market share to work. And you're seeing it now in the products, right? If you just look at the state handle, look at the state share, their their products are now better than any of the land-based guys. And, and, and that's what you're seeing. And, you know, Bernie, we talked at the top about the engagement that we saw around the women's Final Four, the women's championship game that happened yesterday. As you think about that dynamic, is that about bringing more betters onto these platforms or is it about giving existing betters more liquidity, essentially, in the market. There's now a whole series of events that folks were not looking at. Um, you know, not, now they are. I don't know how much, uh, let's say, the, the rise of something like F1 plays into this. Just is it about, like, how does that go for the, for the platforms in thinking about perhaps women's basketball ascending as, you know, maybe the fifth or sixth most popular sport in the U.S. from its current standpoint? 
Yeah, um, I think it just speaks to you have to give, you know, give the people what they want and to be able to, to bet on sports and whatever sport that may be. Um, and at the end of the day that, you know, that's how we view online sports betting. And, and we always get the question because there's a big, been a big shift for online sports betting operators really pushing parlay mix and driving their hold higher. And the question is, well, what point are they going to be bleed their, bleeding their uh, clients dry? But really we're not seeing that yet it's because sports bettors want to be able to bet on more things. It's really an entertainment budget that they're focused on. So as um, you know, new sports gain in popularity, you know, Netflix drops a new documentary about golf, you have the Masters coming up this weekend. Um, you know, th that's really the opportunity where there's, again, like I mentioned before, that convergence with sports betting and sports media, this is really an entertainment budget that they were focused on. Um, and so it's great when someone like Caitlin Clark uh, pops up, uh, even though it's more than pop up, she's been doing great for four years, but um, you know, it gives, it gives the people the, uh, the opportunity to, to further, you know, engage with sports and engage with media through sports betting. Um, and you guys both have DraftKings as an outperform. In fact, you like a lot of the coverage, Jerry. But Jed, I want to zero in with one name with you that you like in particular, and that's Genius Sports, which is not one that I was super familiar with, but it's more of a data provider, if I've got that right. Why do you like that one? Yeah, we like Genius Sports for three reasons. One, we think if you want to play sports betting under a $5 billion market cap, Genius Sports or Sports Radar, the data providers, are going to be your best option. Number two, because they are a data provider, the sports books can't take the technology in house, and they have you know exclusive relationships with their two key leagues, the NFL and the EPL, out until 2028, 2029. So you have good financial predictability. And then third, they you know all the financial metrics are turning positive this year. They're inflecting to positive free cash flow. EBITDA is going to grow 40 percent. So we, we, we like the data providers here. If you're looking for, uh, you know, areas under 5 billion that are not going to be impacted by the consolidation that you're seeing flutter and, and DraftKings do. All right, Jed, Bernie, thank you both. We like the Huskies laying the points tonight. Thanks for stopping by. <laughs> Sports books don't. <laughs> well, as an alum, as an alum, I've been riding at all tournament, all right. and uh, I'm on the right side of that. All right, well, we're wrapping up uh, today's market domination. Of course, we'll take a look at the solar eclipse. Also coming to an end here, it's timed up very nicely with the closing bell on Wall Street. We've got that coming up in a couple minutes here. Market's doing a whole lot of not much. Dow and S&P in the red, NASDAQ in green figures.
there is the closing bell on Wall Street, and now it is market domination overtime. We're joined by Jared Blickery to get you up to speed on the action from today's session. Let's see where the major averages ended. A bit of a photo finish here because we had been trading in the green for the last couple of hours on the Dow, and it looks like we may be finishing very slightly in the red down, just 10 and a half points. The S&P 500 also very slightly in the red. The NASDAQ very slightly in the green. It looks like a lot of traders are focusing in addition to on the moon in front of the sun outside, are also looking ahead to CPI, which comes Wednesday morning, as well as earnings season kicking off once again. The banks really bringing it in earnest on Friday. So a little bit of a waiting game here. But in advance of that, a couple of things I want to check on as we look across assets. We've got the 10-year yield continuing to climb here, 4.42%. So we'll see what kind of reaction we get when we get to the CPI report. Bitcoin, I wanted to mention here, continuing to move higher up above at 71,656, 71,656. Um, so another move upward there. And then finally, WTI I wanted to mention as well because it is coming down a little bit here as we see um, first of all, the absence of an Iranian counterstrike in Israel that some in the market have been anticipating, and it's just a little bit of a calming of the heightened tensions there, although obviously there is still a conflict going on, but seeing uh, oil pull down below $87 a barrel. Let's go over to Jared for a closer look at today's sector action and more. Hey, Jared. Hey, Julie. Well, I'll tell you what. We had uh, not a lot of action in the majors, but underneath the market's hood, we did have some interesting moves. And in the sector action, we have consumer discretionary, that's XLY, up almost 100 percent. Real estate, utilities, financials, materials, all of those in the green. I'll add uh, communication services to that just barely, XLC, of one basis point. What did the worst was energy. Uh, energy was, uh, we saw WTI crude, which Julie was just looking at. That was down just a smidge, but nevertheless, energy tends to be either the best performer or the worst performer on any given day. And when I look at some of the leaders, here we see crypto. We are just taking a look at Bitcoin prices around $72,000, dollars It was not the best day for tech, but when we take a look at unprofitable tech, specifically disruption, we are seeing some gains here. And let me just take a look at that screen real quick. Led by Tesla, so that is a profitable country company, but most of these others are not profitable. And in fact, they've flagged quite a bit this year. So they are playing a little bit of catch a game of catch up, at least today. Miles. All right, the nation of Tesla on yes. watch, Jared. Uh, thanks for that. All right, investors, mostly on the sidelines today. No major index moving more than four basis points on the session as we await uh, key economic data coming up on Wednesday morning. We also get earnings season kicking off. We'll call it with big banks on Friday. Josh Schaefer here with the big takeaways from today's trading day, which I believe was really what everyone wrote to investors over the weekend. Yeah, realistically, right? In a low volume day, we decided to make the takeaways about maybe some broader things, the trends that we're watching in the market. And on my beat specifically, following things like S&P 500 calls, we have a new high watermark for where the S&P 500 could reach this year. Pretty exciting stuff for a low volume trading day. So Wells Fargo coming out and saying they expect the benchmark index to reach 5,300, yeah, 5,535. By the end of the year, that's the highest. The former highest call was Oppenheimer at 5,500. One thing that I found interesting to point out here, Miles, we had talked about the Oppenheimer note a couple weeks ago. And one thing that John Stolzfus had highlighted in that was essentially investors becoming more comfortable with a longer time horizon. And that's sort of playing into some of his reasoning mm -hmm. overall for why he felt confident in the index. And Chris Harvey over at Wells Fargo mentioned something similar here yeah. and essentially said he thinks investors are becoming perhaps a little bit more comfortable with a higher valuation and also a longer time horizon, which would overall mean the index going higher. Yeah, and I think it also, you know, that note zeroed in on this idea of, you know, Julie, the market rally, this current bull market, whatever you want to call this, mm -hmm. it all started like Jan of 2023. That was the moment when everyone said, okay, everything's different now and you know, we can do, Dan Halley will give us a great you know, history one day of all the chat GPT and all these developments. <laughs> and um, I think when you know, Satya went to a conference in Paris in February and said search is on the table, that was a huge moment too. Um, but really it's like this flip to your point, Josh, an investor's mm -hmm. mind of, all right, I, I can worry, I can now go into a meeting comfortably and say, we are looking at a you know three-year time horizon or six months. Like the pain of 2022 was able to be ameliorated, let's say, mm -hmm. by just looking further out in the future. Yeah, and well, and it's it's the secular bull market, and it's also the secular AI growth story, right? That's what Wells Fargo called it, and it's you want to stay involved in that game. 
just because we're a year into it, there are not a lot of people on the street right now saying, okay, we had our run up in AI, let's get out of those stocks now, right? And let's get out of that trade. And I think that's part of it too, is people want to hang along for this ride and see sort of where we're going and where AI's tentacles sort of impact, right? And that's been a large part of the discussion that we've heard recently too. And there's also what doesn't impact that group anymore. We talked to Tim Murray at T. Rowe Price about this a little bit at the top of the show where he talked about the fact that rates are likely going to stay higher than people anticipated for longer will impact the likes of the small caps. What it won't impact is those large caps because mm of AI, he said, basically that's the reason. But right. but still, we're we're seeing investors watch what's going on with the treasury market a little more closely. Oh, definitely, yeah, and that was something that Wells Fargo highlighted in this note as well. One of the key risks would be if we see the 10-year at 5%, Julie, you just noted a few minutes ago, we closed at about 4.43%, pretty significant move in the last month. But Harvey was saying if we see the 10-year at 5% for say six months, that's when we're gonna to start to get really concerned about this bull thesis. And uh, Mike Wilson over at Morgan Stanley has been highlighting this recently too. He circled 4.35% on the 10 year. So we're above that now. And he mentioned in his note on Sunday, he said, well, look what happened when we got past that mark that I pointed out. All of a sudden, everyone cared about the treasury market again. And you saw the correlation from stocks and bonds come back to negative more significantly than it had been in the last couple months. And that sort of spins us forward to the CPI print on Wednesday, right? And you're wondering what happens with the 10 year if we keep ticking higher, does that start to weigh on stocks yeah. more? And then quickly, last thing, volume was down today because everybody was watching the volume eclipse. Volume was down because everyone was watching the eclipse. I went Very through, nice. I used our Yahoo Finance market data, which I recommend everyone go out there and do to track your trading Look volume. This guy. Look at this guy, and come on. And the S&P 500, it was the lowest volume we've had in at least, I saw November most likely, if not more than a year. I was wow. tracking through it. So maybe people stepped away from their desk and actually had a little bit of fun Definitely. today. So we were the stiffs who sat in here and, you know, we're grinding it out. Or people who went the out on the team who went outside. We didn't lock everyone in the office. No, no, but I'm saying, you know, Just us, us personally, this group here yeah. at the table specifically. I went, I went out and looked for a minute. You missed out on the a big thing. The two of us then. Fine. We don't need him. Just the two of us. <laughs> Just right. me and Julie. Thanks, Josh. Well, well, the street high for the S&P 500 is now at 55.53. Our next guest says, hold my beer. He is looking at an even higher uh, target for the S&P 500 this year, 5750. Joining us now is Infrastructure Capital Advisor CEO Jay Hatfield. And indeed, in a recent note, you talked about 5750. AI is part of it, and the Fed outlook is part of it. So, so talk, us, talk to us about how you got there. Thanks, Julie. Well, it, it does relate to the conversation we're just having. We're assuming the 10-year goes to three and a quarter. Ah. <laughs> so if it doesn't, then the theoretical value of the S&P is way below our target. Mm -hmm. So we can't accept, it's not gonna work if Jamie Dimon's right and we have 8% treasuries. But we are bullish notwithstanding the fact that our economy is strong because Europe is very weak. And US investors have a very strong tendency to ignore the rest of the world, which makes all the sense in the world with equities because you have Nvidia, all the, the best companies are here and everybody looks to the US for equities. But with bonds, that, they're very fungible. So if the ECB cuts, um, I think the UK will cut. We always already had the Swiss bank cut. Global rates should rally, and that will spark the next leg of the rally. Have you, Jay, been surprised at the way with which equity investors specifically have kind of made their peace with the notion that rates are going to be higher for longer? I mean, if we went back in time six months, um, well, we saw the market you know, have a rough patch in the fall of last year. And you know, fast forward to now, maybe it's June, but everyone's like, ah, it's fine. We're going we're gonna to be handling this just fine. Have you been surprised by that resilience, maybe? Really, I would, yeah, what we would call this uh, when I worked at big hedge funds is a bad short. Like this market should be getting smashed, right? We went from yeah. 380 at the beginning of the year to 435, and we're just churning around at all time highs. So what I think is happening is exactly like last year, why we were bullish last year. Yeah. Everybody knows the next inflection is a cut. Last year was a pause. So why do you want to sell now just because it's going to take two more months to have the cut? Well, and to that point, do you feel there's a positioning part of this market too? Are people still caught like flat-footed, to your point, on the wrong side of this, because that's you know that's really what happened in 22. What happened in 23 and is 24 just an extension of that kind of <laughs> idea in the market. Absolutely, and not just hedge funds, but also just individuals are very attracted to having five percent money that's low risk. Like 
I advised one of my friends on his portfolio. He called me up and said, oh, I want to raise another 10% cash because I can get five in the market. And I said, well, but if small caps are up 25 and the market's up 15, mm -hmm. then you're going to leave 10% on the table. So I do think a lot of people took solace in getting higher rates and are being too conservative because you don't want to miss the first leg of the rally because that's where you get the excess returns. From there on, you get the normal kind of 10%. We should get 15 to 20 probably this year and next year. So, you know, when I look at this and see 57, 15, here you say three and a quarter on the 10 year. Three and a quarter feels like a, a sort of a bigger swing than 57, 50 to me, just in my gut. Right. How high conviction are you and are you hedging those views? Well, I think that we would get really concerned if the ECB started to say they were going to push mm. off those cuts. We have been short Fed fund futures uh, most of this year, which is a mildly profitable trade. You have to do billions to actually make it move. It doesn't move around that much. So um, we had expected that all along, and we would have been reevaluating, re maybe lowering our target if it was dependent on the Fed. But the thing to keep in mind is that the dollar is going to be very strong. If the ECB cuts, the UK cuts, Fed holds, the dollar is going to continue to appreciate. That's very deflationary. Oil's priced in dollars. We're bearish about CPI printing a little bit hot because uh, uh, oil prices have run up, gasoline prices have run up. So if we get declining oil prices, lower commodities, stronger dollar, it's very deflationary. So that should give the Fed cover to cut in July, even if our economy continues to be strong. But it sounds like maybe the Fed is comfortable being a little bit of a global outlier in that, you know, again, in a situation where you have the dollar doing some of the work they need done for them on the inflation side, they might be comfortable, you know, not following, you know, Matt Amelgard right away, giving, mm -hmm. giving them a little bit of a lead time. Would that be a change maybe from the way the Fed has thought of their role as a global central bank? Uh, no doubt. And also it's extremely unusual for other central banks to go before the Fed because it massively weakens their currency. So it's not the normal situation, but this US economy is just a juggernaut. You know, the combination of AI, we have a housing shortage, none of this exists in Europe. Europe has floating rate mortgages, by the way. So it's terrible for consumers. We have almost none because of the financial crisis. So the US advantages, natural gas prices are 80% below the rest of the world, are so profound, this is a very unusual cycle. Like, we should have a recession right now. Jay, really interesting, thought-provoking. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. And thanks to Miles as well. Thanks for sitting in thanks today. For Appreciate me, it and guys. filling in for Josh. Don't go anywhere though. I'm still here and there's still a lot to get to, including Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen's visit to China. We'll get a take on that when market domination overtime returns.
A $78 billion tax cut package could hit a dead end in the Senate, thanks to Republican lawmakers. With more on the bill's roadblock and the potential consequences, we're joined by Yahoo Finance's Rick Newman. We haven't talked about this in a little while, Rick, so tell us what's going on. Well, this passed the House in uh, January, and it was a rare moment of bipartisanship in what, uh, what otherwise seemed a very dysfunctional Congress. Uh, this was a tax $78 billion worth of tax cuts that passed the House with both Republican and Democratic votes. But uh, it was known at the time, much tougher road in the Senate. And now th this bill seems to be basically grinding down in the Senate. We've got some Republicans saying, uh, no, they don't like the Democratic tax cuts in this. Uh, and then behind the scenes, uh, there are some Republicans who just don't want to give President Biden a legislative victory um, while he's campaigning for re-election. So what's really happening, Democrats are, are ready to move this bill in the Senate, but it's really Republicans who are standing the way of a tax cut bill. And there are some tax cuts for businesses here. And the business lobby says um, these tax cuts for businesses are actually essential. It things, it's things like speeding up the research and development tax credit stuff that is supposed to juice innovation and investment at the corporate level. Um, it seems likely this thing is not going to pass this year. I mean, it, it is hard to get anything done the closer you get to elections. And uh, Republicans seem to be gambling that they'll be able to get a better tax cut deal after the 2024 uh, elections in November, which implies that they think they have a good chance of at least winning more control of government than they have now. I'm not sure they're right about that. But at this point, I think we'd be surprised if uh, this uh, tax cut gets passed. Well, and Rick, so I have a two-part question then uh, sort of to follow on that. One, how is them blocking this going to play in the election? And two, what about the Trump tax cuts that are set to expire? Yep, very, very important points, Julie. So how this plays in the 2024 uh, campaign, I think, is up to uh, if Republicans do end up blocking this tax cut, I think it's up to... How well President Biden and his uh, fellow Democrats, how well they play it. Uh, I mean, um, the, the roadmap some analysts are pointing to here is Harry Truman in 1948. He was polling terribly uh, at this point prior to the election, perhaps even a little bit worse than Joe Biden is doing. And he ran against the Republican do-nothing Congress, and it worked for him. Can Biden pull that off? I kind of have my doubts. Biden has not turned out to be a great communicator, and we know from other analysis uh, a lot of what Biden said just says just goes over voters' heads. They don't even they don't even know what he's accomplished or, or what he's out on the campaign trail saying. And then when you mention those uh, the 2017 tax cuts, the individual tax cuts from that deal expire at the end of 25. And I think that is the moment everybody with big plans for any kind of tax cut or tax hike for that matter. Everybody is looking ahead to that. Those end at the end of 25. Congress has to do something. So, so when that happens, that is going to be the triggering mechanism for the next big tax bill. And what that tax bill is depends on, number one, who wins the White House, and number two, who wins control of Congress. So TBD, obviously. Rick, thanks very much for walking us through all Thank of you, this. Julie. Appreciate it. Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen visiting China for discussions about the U.S. and China's economic relationship. And Yellen saying she's not ruling out tariffs on China's green energy exports and that the U.S. wants to find a way forward regarding TikTok. With us now to talk more about the trip is Shazad Kazi, China Beige Book International Managing Director. Good to see you, Shazad. So um, the fact that Yellen is even there is a step forward, since obviously there had been some tensions. But what do you think has come or will still come out of this trip that is going to represent more progress than just her being there? Yeah, you know, I think, first of all, I don't think if you, the administration wanted to send a very serious message uh, to their Chinese counterparts about overcapacity and China dumping its cheap products abroad, uh, Secretary Yellen was the right person to send. The right person to send probably would actually have been the U.S. Trade Representative, Catherine Tai, who has a very serious agenda on all of these subjects. Uh, Secretary Yellen is widely regarded as a dove. I don't think that the Chinese government and the Communist Party take any warnings coming from her very, very seriously. If this was about the detente, about uh, uh, you know, meet and greet and keeping things positive and smiling, well, then she was perhaps the right person for that. It was interesting that we got the news of the TSMC grant in Arizona today, right? A, a Taiwan-based company that's going to be building manufacturing capacity in the U.S. 
was that deliberate? Was that also sending a message at the same time? Well, you know, not so much probably, but the fact is that the administration is running into some trouble with its larger industrial policy that has to be accepted. Uh, I think there are lots of things that can probably be done better. As we know, TSMC has decided to delay some of its planned productions and so forth. I think, if anything, the Communist Party looks at it and says, look, you can't really compete with us as much as you think or you claim that you can. Interesting. Okay, so when you hear um, the secretary talking about, you know, not ruling out certain types of export controls, how seriously are we to take that? Or do you listen to someone like Catherine Tsai in, in, in a contrast? Yeah, I think, you know, the administration will have to, sooner or later, do something about this. No matter who's president in 2025, that administration will have to do something about this. Uh, solar products, EVs, uh, so on and so forth, because I think Chinese overcapacity, dumping its cheap products abroad, et cetera, threatening industries in, Euro in Europe and in America, of course, is a very real threat. Um, so the question, of course, is how far do you go in terms of sanctioning uh, or putting trade tariffs, rather, I should say, on these products? And then, of course, how do you counter that with also doing industrial policy here? Because we have to keep in mind, tariffs raise prices. And the worst outcome would, of course, be just raising prices on uh, technologies that are necessary uh, for sort of the energy transition uh, that, that different governments around the world are looking for. And how binary is the approach of President, Tr uh, President Biden versus if President Trump uh, wins election again on that particular topic? President Trump's team right now is looking for very, very aggressive action, as, we, as we've heard, 60 percent tariffs across the board, potentially pulling the United States out of the World Trade Organization, ending PNTR, with China, all sorts of very hardline tactics. On the Biden spectrum, I think there's a lot more continuity from the Trump tariff days without starting any new investigations. We know that the USTR has been sidelined without putting on any new tariffs and going piecemeal on the export control piece. The Trump side would be far more revisionist, I think, in its second round than it was even in its first round. And they really shook things up the first time around. And to take a step back for a moment as well, what's your current assessment of the Chinese economy and therefore the strength or lack thereof that they have in in any kinds of negotiations because of that? Yeah, you know, I mean, the Chinese economy actually isn't doing as poorly as markets kept saying all of last year. And if you look at China Beige Book data, the March numbers that came out, the spending, consumer spending actually has been looking good through the first part of the year. March uh, looked fairly good. Manufacturing made a come, uh, you know, comeback, I would say. And manufacturing was much stronger in 2023 than anybody realized, mainstream at least. So the Chinese economy is not doing that great, but it's certainly not in the dumps as the mainstream the consensus view had it for a while. And there was also the view in some quarters that China was going to be exporting deflation in a more decided fashion. If you look at just at our CPI numbers, that hasn't come to pass. But are we seeing that in certain segments? Um, it can happen. It can happen if, if this continued uh, a policy of relying on manufacturing to sort of you know buoy growth or drive the economy forward continues, and we find more and more Chinese products finding their way abroad at very cheap prices. It could certainly happen. But you're right; we haven't really seen it on mass yet. The China disinflation thesis is very overplayed domestically, for sure. There's no evidence of Chinese disinflation really at home. All right, Chazad, interesting stuff. Thank you so much for coming in. Appreciate it. Thank you. And it's time now for What to Watch on Tuesday, April 9th. Starting off with the Federal Reserve, tune into Yahoo Finance tomorrow at 3 p.m. Eastern for an exclusive interview with Atlanta Fed President Rafael Bostic. This coming after Bostic's comments last week saying he does not see a cut coming this year until the fourth quarter. Moving over to earnings, Tilray reporting its third quarter numbers for 2024 tomorrow before the bell. Although the Canadian cannabis company is making considerable financial gains, its long-term success still hinges on federal legalization in the U.S. The stock is up more than 50 percent in the last month. And finally, taking a look at the economy, we're getting a new piece of economic data in the morning. It's the monthly small business optimism index from the NFIB. That number is expected to tick up slightly for March. And that'll do it for today's market domination over time. Be sure to come back tomorrow at 3 p.m. Eastern for all of your coverage leading up to and after the closing bell. Stay tuned. We've got more Yahoo Finance on the other side.
The U.S. labor market facing a shift to den Gen Z, making up 30 percent of the workforce by 2030, according to the Bureau of Labor Statistics. And as Gen Z gains ground in a workforce facing the rise of the gig economy, professional development platform How to College is looking to democratize uh, home to college is looking to democratize access to young professionals. Home from College co-founder and CEO Julia Habers joining us now with insights on what Gen Z job hunters have their sights on. Home from College, that's the name of the thing. Julia, thank you so much for being here. Um, thank so you for having me. This, I guess if you could explain to folks, first of all, when you look at the constellation of, of job sites out there, what makes Home from College different from those? So Home from College is really oriented in helping students start their career really at the entry point of their professional journey. We focus on people really between the ages of, ages of 17 to 27 years old, or old, really focused on that infancy of professional development. So honing those skills, learning who you are, rather than being geared towards the professional developers. So people who are focused on really starting their journey rather than people in the professional world already. And what kind of, I mean, what's also interesting to me, I guess, is that some of these are short-term gigs, some of them are projects, some of them are longer term. Um, why is that the case? Is it that, you know, maybe some of these people are still in college and they want to do these jobs on the side or they want more flexibility when they are getting out of school? We've learned that 80% of Gen Z are graduating without internships, meaning that they are entering the workforce without any really clear sense of who they are, what they're good at, or what experiences they should apply for full time. We saw a huge opportunity to be a place for students to test and learn what they like by doing. So the gig economy is here for Gen Z, and we know that 70% of Gen Z even plan on having a side hustle post-grad. So really being focused on giving them the tools to try things, to learn who they are. And many of these roles range from product testing, focus groups, Gen Z advisory panels. So low lift skills that allow them to make money, learn who they are, and then ultimately make good decisions when they're ready to pursue something full time. Julia, I don't know if you know the answer to this from your research, but why aren't internships happening? Uh, you know, I thought that was sort of a given and part of you know, what the college uh, employment office help or counseling office helps folks do. And it's just sort of part of a given. Is it something that has changed over time? Or are they not getting the support? So I think ultimately the goal is for everyone to get an internship. There are over 25 million students in the U.S. and access to opportunities is not always even. So ultimately the goal is for everyone to get professional experiences. And I know the schools are trying their very best, but when schools have over 60,000 students in them, there are only few career service professionals who have the ability to help. And we learned that the flexibility of giving people a chance to try little projects is ultimately more beneficial because you learn quickly what you like and don't like. So our goal is to really help you learn about what you like to do, who you are, um, make money by doing it. And then ultimately, if you can get an internship, amazing. We have roles like that as well on the platform. But the goal is to give everyone a chance, no matter the access you come from. You know, we're showing some of the most popular um, jobs that folks are applying to or gigs that people are applying to. The question that also came up um, in our show meeting as we were discussing this is how much of this is also um, Gen Z trying to push towards the influencer market or, you know, developing the skills to eventually do that. Does this also feed into that? The audience is definitely socially native. So an area where we have focused is content creation because that is an, a, a desire for many. It, they see it's an opportunity to make money, control their own narrative, um, represent themselves potentially with other companies as well. So that is a theme. I would say it also is a, has a low barrier to entry. So people who are just beginning, who maybe don't have a ton of hard skills, can put a phone up and start to create content and see how that goes. I wouldn't say it's the core focus, but it allows this generation to work with companies in a way that is not as high skill or as high barrier. Interesting. All right, Julia, thank you so much. Appreciate it. Yeah, thanks for having me. Coming up, what's holding Eli Lilly back from meeting demand on its weight loss shot Zepbound? We'll discuss on the other side when Yahoo Finance returns.
The complexity of making injector pens holding Eli Lilly back from meeting demand on its weight loss shot ZepBound. What's a possible solution? Lilly could ditch the pen and sell ZepBound in vials that would allow people to give themselves the medicine with their own syringes. Now, a move our next guest that is, has been advocating for in a campaign known as hashtag release the vials. Dave Knapp, host of On The Pen Live, joining us now to discuss along with Yahoo Finance's Anjali Kamlani. So Dave, first of all, um, I'm so curious how you came to this, right? Because you do have um, a, a blogcast, I guess, a vodcast that you do where you talk about this issue but how did you, I know you started using the product. Just tell us your story. Yeah, absolutely. So I was diagnosed with type 2 diabetes at a pretty young age. Uh, 2021 in the fall, I received my diagnosis. And I tried a lot of things in that year to sort of get my blood sugars down, to help get my weight under control, all those things that help uh, to control your diabetes. Uh, after a year of white knuckling it, uh, my doctor uh, introduced the idea of bariatric surgery. And because I did not have coverage for bariatric surgery at the time, he pushed me to these uh, new class of medications called GLP-1 or incretin mimetic therapies. And that's where I learned about Manjaro. And basically the way that he couched it at that time was these medicines are actually doing hormonally for people what bariatric surgery does. So we've now found medical ways to accomplish what bariatric surgery can accomplish. And so in the course of my investigating the medicine and trying to learn everything I could about what these medications could possibly do, what I found from content on the web was typically more a uh, vlog, a day in the life of, or here's how I lost a hundred pounds with, at the time Ozempic was the big one, right? And what I found was from the patient and lay person perspective, there was very little out there in the way of information about these medications. It was all pretty brand new. And so really what I sought out to do the day that I was prescribed Manjaro was uh, to just start making content about everything I could learn about these medications so that those who would come behind me and I knew based upon my quick research that there would be millions and millions of people to come behind me. Uh, and so to just kind of lay the groundwork for people to know how to get started. And then it sort of evolved into just staying on top of everything news-wise because there have been so many issues about accessibility to the medication. Dave, I'd love to know, you know, you are talking about all the issues that patients face. You've also been pushing this program uh, for the patients to gain access. I wonder too, in addition to the product itself, the pens, I know that there is also generally a shortage uh, because of the way that these companies have been looking at manufacturing, as well as even some pharmacies, especially the smaller ones, not having access because of reimbursement. So it's, it seems like a multi-pronged issue that is causing the shortage. Aside from the vials, have you had any luck with alternative sources or you know, there's also compounding, for example, uh, with access to that? in a safe way? Sure, and that's a great question. I think, you know, I'll leave the, I'll leave the conversations about the safety and the efficacy of the compounded or generic versions of these medications which are allowed when a medication is in a shortage. I'll leave that conversation to the doctors, but you are right, it is a multifaceted approach. I mean, currently, obviously, you've got these medications in shortage. Uh, the shortage really is, <laughs> you know, unprecedented demand. And I think Eli Lilly did a good job. They had they had sort of a forerunner in Novo Nordisk's uh, blockbusters, Ozempic and Wagovi, to sort of show what, uh, what the maybe acceptance rate would be on the insurance side as far as the addition of the medications to the formulary. So they had sort of a forerunner and sometimes being the second person to the party, there's a little advantage. But even though they had that, and even though you've seen them announce major investments in the United States in manufacturing, there's the news obviously today about the groundbreaking over in Germany for the ex-US markets. They just can't keep up with 100,000 prescriptions a week. You saw Eli Lilly and uh, Zepbound specifically Eclipse with Govi, which are both weight, the weight loss indications uh, from Novo Nordisk and Eli Lilly respectively. You saw Zepbound Eclipse with Govi for the first time in new prescriptions just a week ago. And there's just no way they can keep up with that when you consider the complexity of the pens and the manufacturing of these very, very difficult, uh, in Dave Ricks, CEO of Eli Lilly's own words, some of the most complex things to manufacture in the country. 
So just quickly, Dave, have you been unable to get the medication you need and either you or people you've heard from, you know, we keep hearing you got, once you're on this stuff, you gotta keep taking it. What happens if you do miss a dose? Sure, so I think it's important to separate the conversation between diabetic patients and patients taking for obesity simply because uh, they're different medications. So the Manjaro uh, medication has been on and off the FDA shortage list for the last year or, or year or more. Uh, Zepbound has not been added to that list until very recently. Uh, I myself have had to step back and dose. And, and you know, as a diabetic, the upper doses of these medications are really where the magic happens for a lot of people, not only from a, a glucose control, but for those who have type 2 diabetes that are also taking it, hopefully, to lose a little bit of weight. So I myself have had to step back in doses. I've been very fortunate to have doctors who are willing to put in the effort and energy to advocate for me and help me find the branded versions. It's getting harder and harder, though. Uh, I've heard from thousands and I'm talking thousands of people through my social media channels. Katrina drove seven plus hours uh, the other day round trip calling over 300 pharmacies just to find a medication, uh, a, a Manjaro script that was a step back in the dose that she was on. Mm -hmm. So you start, and, and this is not an isolated story. So you start to get a feel for the, the throngs of people who are really having to make massive adjustments in their life just to stay on the medication. And, you know, sadly, what I'm hearing from a lot of fellow diabetics is that their A1C is is going out of whack because they've had to extend the period of time that they take the shots. It's a once weekly shot. So maybe they're taking it every 10 days or every 12 days and they're paying a price uh, through their through their blood glucose numbers and things like that. So a lot of people are looking towards, as you alluded to, some of those other off label options which again, I'll leave the conversation about the safety and efficacy to the experts on that, but uh, there are questions, right? Yeah, most definitely. Well, Dave, keep us posted. Of course, we'll be talking to the companies too to see if they make any changes. Really appreciate your time, and thanks to Anjali as well. Thank you for having me. That'll do it for today's Yahoo Finance Live. Be sure to come back tomorrow at 3 p.m. Eastern for all of your coverage leading up to and after the closing bell. Yahoo Finance as well is your guide, your group of advisors, planners, and jargon busters to help you save, build, and grow your money. How do I know if I'm saving enough for retirement? How do I know if it's right for me to go on that lavish vacation? Is it finally time to refinance my mortgage? How do I pay less in taxes? We'll get you the answers you need. Wealth, earning it, growing it, and managing it. It's more than tracking just the latest market moves. It's more than your favorite trending tickers. One does not simply build wealth without considering the entire financial landscape. It takes a community and we've built one for you. Wealth cuts through the noise to help guide your financial decisions so that your money works for you. Wealth on Yahoo Finance premieres March 25th. Fusion Energy has long been hailed as a holy grail because of its potential for near limitless amounts of clean energy. But that potential has trailed reality for decades with billions of dollars in research leading to few breakthroughs. Now there's optimism that's about to change with startups funded by big name backers including Sam Altman, Jeff Bezos and Bill Gates. I went inside one fusion reactor to explore the challenges of bringing this technology to commercial use for our latest episode of Next. When this machine gets turned on, it'll be one of the hottest points in the solar system, if not the hottest point. It's hotter than the core of the sun. A little bit toroidally positive of the center of the chimney. What we're working on here is building our own version of a star on Earth. Imagine if humankind could harness the sun. That's the potential for fusion energy. It's a goal that's eluded researchers for decades, but that promise of fusion energy has investors placing their bets. The industry's attracted $6 billion in funding with Bill Gates and Jeff Bezos, part of a growing list of backers. 
The U.S. government set aside nearly one and a half billion dollars for fusion research in 2024 alone, a record amount. It is the holy grail. Energy without harmful carbon emissions, without radioactive waste. Fusion technology could be disruptive at an even bigger level than the internet. The only thing is, we don't have a breakthrough yet. A breakthrough resulting in clean and unlimited amounts of energy. Success in research labs like this are critical, with more than 40 companies looking to get fusion power on the grid globally. We were invited in for an exclusive look. So D3D is the largest operating fusion reactor in the United States. We're doing the fundamental research to figure out how we can create a nuclear fusion power plant in the future. Getting ready? Yep. Lower hybrid. Zero degrees. Nuclear fusion is extremely difficult to do. OK, other direction. Let's do a double shot at the bottom. Thank you very much. Three seconds, two, one, shot progress. The race is on to actually see who can develop this and who can get it to the masses the fastest. inside the machine, it's always a very interesting experience. Before you go in, the first thing you have to do is get suited up. Got a hairnet. Don't want to leave anything behind the reactor. These are dosimeters to measure radiation exposure. To get in, it's a little tight. You have to squeeze in. The stakes are high inside this vacuum chamber known as a tokamak. So we're not on the center. Keep going right there, right there, right there. Other axis. That's actually pretty dead on. All right, sweet. Tucked inside the country's largest magnetic fusion facility, researchers here are attempting to create a star on Earth. Like so chasing the promise of clean energy through a process called nuclear fusion. The word nuclear can be scary. There's definitely a lot of confusion between traditional nuclear power, so nuclear fission, which we currently have today, and nuclear fusion. Nuclear fission takes a very large atom, splits it apart. And the way fusion works is we're going to take two atoms and we're going to smash them together. And when they fuse, they convert some of their mass to energy. So Einstein's famous E equals mc squared equation. Nuclear fusion generally only happens in stars where it's contained by the gravity of its own mass. Here on Earth, what we do is we use strong magnetic fields to create a container called a tokamak. The temperature inside the machine is about 10 times the core of the sun. If you were to make this super hot fusion plasma and it were to touch the wall, then the wall would be immediately vaporized. The idea behind the tokamak is that you're going to make a bottle out of magnetic field, so that way this super hot fusion plasma never touches the walls. We know how to do fusion, but we just can't do it efficiently enough to get more power out than what we put in. And that's the key to making fusion commercially viable, finding a way to generate more energy than scientists used to create that fusion reaction. Last week, scientists at the National Ignition Facility achieved fusion ignition. This is one of the most impressive scientific feats of the 21st century. Researchers at Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory achieved that energy gain two years ago, but that reaction lasted less than one billionth of a second, and it was done using lasers, unlike a tokamak, which uses magnets. When NIF, the National Ignition Facility, achieved ignition, they used very powerful lasers to create a reaction in a very small capsule, and that perhaps has difficulties scaling up Whereas what we do here, which is use very large scale, powerful magnets, seems to have a clear path towards a nuclear power plant that could power your home. Those here at D3D are trying to unlock that same breakthrough using magnets with funding from the Department of Energy. That development could pave the path to commercialization. 
And this is where this very healthy university, U.S. national laboratory, and private industry partnership comes into play. Right now, D3D is an event. What that means is the machine is not operating on a daily basis. But what that means also is that we're upgrading a lot of systems. During this upgrade period, we're installing new systems so that in the future we can test new regimes of science. So for the first time, we're testing a new technology that could improve the heating of the fusion reaction. All right, you ready? Got the head. And I've got the tail. But for the first time, we put these modules into the machine. That's one. Seven one down, one. eight to go. This system will improve the stability of the plasma. The plasma fills this volume, and for fusion to happen, you need a hot, dense plasma. And this system helps increase temperature, it adds energy to the plasma, and improves stability so that we can have more fusion reactions occur. This is a system that could play a role in designing a future nuclear fusion power plant. The process of getting there is an expensive one, billions of dollars just to build the reactors. So what we're going to do is we'll take this out here, and then we'll slide this rod in here. But big name investors are lining up to fund the research because a potential breakthrough could transform industries. Just think, limitless energy, no fossil fuels, no carbon emissions. Which is why you've got Google and Chevron, Bill Gates and Sam Altman, Jeff Bezos all placing their bets. D3D isn't looking to commercialize this technology, it's laying the groundwork for it. So when D3D is ready to go online, the tokamak's gonna get closed up, we're gonna turn the machine on. Starting setup for shot 555. There's a couple countdown timers. Three seconds, two, one. Shot and then at time zero, everything starts. And you can hear out in the power yard, you can hear a lot of the big electronic equipment making these sounds, these pulsing sounds. Magnetic fields are turned on, we inject gas, and that gas then turns into a plasma. We put in about 20 to 40,000 homes worth of power just to make this fusion plasma hot. And then on top of that, we shoot in electromagnetic waves, and each one of our seven sources puts in about the equivalent of a thousand home kitchen microwaves. We call our plasma discharges that we have shots. They last five to eight seconds. And then it's over. We're gonna collect all this data, and all the science team is gonna work together to figure out what it means. Those seconds may seem short, but it's an eternity for fusion technology. The challenge is to control those reactions long enough so they can sustain the plasma for much longer, months at a time for a commercial power plant. The perennial question for what we do here is, is when? When you will have power on the grid? I've seen estimates within the next couple of years for some of these startups to 2050 and beyond. Roughly two dozen other reactors are racing to be first. In France, 35 countries have joined forces to build the world's largest fusion reactor, with a price tag of $20 billion. But so far, progress has been slow. You know what I mean? Yeah, so we have this guy's a radical, that guy's a radical, this way, right? And then you just adjust whatever you have to on this guy. As research labs like D3D aim to achieve new milestones for energy output, larger tokamaks under construction are looking to extend the length of fusion reactions. At Commonwealth Fusion Systems, an MIT spinoff backed by Google and Bill Gates, researchers hope to fire the first shot in their reactor later next year. Eater in France is expected to come online later this decade. With climate change looming, I think the desire for a technology like nuclear fusion is only going to grow. There's a lot more willingness to talk about unproven types of renewable energy like fusion because we're running out of options. And so you're seeing fusion research appear more and more at these global summits like COP28. Fusion may turn out to be just an enormous game changer. You're seeing politicians like John Kerry talk about it. You're seeing international groups of research come together with promises of funding from various governments. 
The potential for fusion energy is that we power the world's energy needs for millions of years without harmful environmental impacts. This is a long-term project that could save humanity. The existential question is, will it be ready in time? Microsoft has already signed a deal with Washington-based Helion to buy electricity powered by fusion energy in four years. The company says it's on target to have a commercial power plant operating by 2028, generating enough electricity to power 50,000 homes, and that could just be the beginning. Bloomberg Intelligence estimates the valuation for fusion energy is likely to grow to $40 trillion if it captures just 1% of the global energy output.